Evening everybody, this is Dr. Hack, and we are back, guys, to think about the Roy Lopez. And remember, we have dialed the difficulty down on this thing, and we are going to look at it from a very, very beginner, uh, amateur standpoint. Um, and we're just going to understand how to crush our opponents using it. We want to know all the strategy, right? Because I'm a strategy guy. I'm not a I'm not a lions guy. I don't memorize stuff. I learn what's going on. You know, when you lift the hood and look at that engine. So, in this case, you get what you get. Just don't throw some fits. Or if you do, put them in the comments. Shoot. All right. So, uh, here's the move that we're going to play. And the question that we have to ask first, the first question. Why this move? Why not a move like knight to c3? They're both really, really good moves, right? Um, and we know they both work very well at higher levels of, of chess. So why is this move better for us? Because it is better for us, okay? And the key, the key thing for us. And there's a principle at play here, uh, which is in, in amateur chess and beginner level chess, Attack is better than defense, okay? So if you're the guy that's attacking, if you're the guy that's putting pressure on the other guy's pieces, this is called tension, then you have an advantage over the other guy because he can make mistakes and he will lose material if he makes those mistakes. And if you make mistakes, there's nothing he can capture, right? There's no tension on your stuff here. So in this case, white is attacking black in two different places and black might make mistakes because of that but white can't make mistakes. Also, the other thing that's happening that you really can't see, right, this is a big one, is that white, the, the black player has a bigger workload when he's calculating than white does. And that is critical later on, okay? Because if you get to like move 10 and he's got a bigger workload and he's gonna start cracking under the pressure, or move 20, the, the human mind can only take so much. And what I mean by that is every time he wants to play a move, like say this one, he has to think about, well, what happens if white takes the knight and then takes the pawn? Is that bad for me? What if he wants to play this move? Well, what happens if white takes the knight and then takes the pawn? Is that bad for me? So every time he thinks about a new move in his calculation, he's going to have to calculate what happens if white takes the knight. And you don't have to do that as white. That's not your workload. Okay. Critical to, to understand. Attack is better than defense. Okay. So, so what, if, uh, what if we do take the knight? I think that's important to, to try to get what that strategy actually is. Because this does change the game more so than most things. This is a big one. Okay. Uh, let's start off with the easy one, though. You know, what, what, what if we take the pawn? Is that good for us? Let's look at it from Black's point of view. It says Black to move. What do you do? Right. So if you're solving a tactic uh, for winning material, not like a checkmate or something, what you do is you look for the things that are not defended very well. And this knight, definitely not defended very well, right? This pawn, definitely not defended very well. As a matter of fact, those things have nothing defending them at all. Same with this one, nothing defending it. If you can play a move with black that attacks two of those things that I circled with the same move, that's a fork. Or some people call it a double attack, right? And in a double attack, excuse me, in a double attack, if you can make one single move with white that defends both things, then you can save the day. But that's not always possible. And, and here in this case, it's actually not possible. So we play a move like this one. We're attacking this one and we're attacking this one. Well, right? How does he save it? Well, he's probably going to save the bigger one, like the knight will move, and then we can take the smaller one. Sure, right? It's pretty good. What if we went out to this one? Well, right? We're attacking a, a hanging piece and a hanging piece. So he's probably going to save the bigger one, however he does it, and we're probably going to take the smaller one. So what black is gonna get his pawn back two different ways if he wants to. Hmm. So was taking that pawn a good idea? No, <laughs> right? Okay, so, so we're not gonna take the pawn, but we still have to understand the strategy of what happens when we take this knight because we could take that knight at some point in the future too. You know, it doesn't have to be now and we don't have to think about this pawn very much. Okay, in order to do this, to teach you something that is uh, unnecessary, right? We, we won't need to know this in order to play what we're going to play in the game, but I need you to know this so that you don't do some things. Okay. So, so bear with me here. I know this is going to be a, a stretch. Okay. So we're going to play this pawn up and we're going to trade these two off. 
I don't know if this is a good move or not. We're just going to do it because we want to see it with these pawns missing. And I am going to then rip the pieces off the board too because they're going to make your spidey senses go off and you're going to be like, tactics, dude, tactics. There are no tactics because there are no pieces. Ta-da. Okay, so, so now we want to ask the question, can any of these pawns by themselves ever make a queen with no help? Nothing helping them. Can they get by these three? And uh, in order to figure that out, I'm going to smush these guys together in the middle to save some time. And now that we ask the question, okay, let's say he moves the pawn forward. Can any of these pawns by themselves without help ever make it to here? And if white doesn't react, the answer is no. Because whenever black captures one of these things, watch what happens. Nope, you're not getting through. Nope, you're not getting through. He went the other way. Nope, you're not getting through. Nope, you're not getting through. Let's say white was, was crazy a little bit. And he said, ooh, look, a free pawn. And he took it. Whoops, back up one. And he took it. Well, now the answer is yes, black can get through. Because black has two pawns against this one. So he can play a move like that. And once this pawn leaves, he can push this one on. Right? There's nothing in front of it. So if this king was too far away, that would become a queen. Yikes, right? But if we don't react at this moment, if white doesn't react, then black can never make a passed pawn, period, without help. And the, the you know you go back to this and you look at it and you say, can white make a passed pawn? And the answer to that is, yeah, he can. These two together, if they march up the board one at a time, eventually they'll reach this moment where they attack this black pawn and it'll make a choice. If it trades, there will be a passed pawn sitting here. And I can make this happen, I think. Right, this moment here. If the black pawn ever moves past it, then this pawn can get in and get a queen if there's nothing in the way, right? And if, if this pawn ever trades, then we have a pawn here that can get in and get a queen if there's nothing in front of it. So white pawns by themselves can make a passed pawn and maybe make a queen. The black pawns by themselves cannot. That's the only advantage you get from taking that knight. And that is ridiculously useless. And this is why I wanted to show you this, right? Um, because... For us, for amateurs, the game, we're going to lose material or win material by move 20 or 25 almost every game. You know, we're never going to go into an end game with equal amounts of material with this level of strategy still going on. It's just not going to happen. So, so we know that taking this knight is not our cup of tea. This is for the masters. This is for the, the experts and the masters and Bobby Fisher. For us, for the rest of us, we're going to stop and think, maybe this bishop is just more valuable than the knight. Because if we take the knight, the strategy is 40 moves away and we can't get there. Okay, so let's not take the knight. Let's keep the bishop on the board. And now we know why we're making this choice that we're making as beginners. We're going to keep the bishop on the board. And we're going to make the assumption from here on out that this bishop is more valuable than this knight. Okay, so let me play another move for black. Now, uh, if you're worried about me not showing all the variations... Uh, don't worry, I'm going to come back and we're going to do a video on weird move threes and weird move fours, right? That's happening. But for now, let's just understand the strategy between these two pieces, which is going to drive the next bit of strategy to happen within the game. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and castle for white. Because what I want to do is I want to make the threat to this pawn become real. Because before this, we had the possibility that the queen would come out, remember, and fork the weak pawn and fork the knight that would be here if we took the pawn. But now that we're castled, this pawn is defended, and so that one's not weak anymore, and this actually is a real threat now for white. We're about to take the knight, and we're about to win a pawn. And that actually will be good for white. So he, black has to do something. <clears throat> He's going to defend his e-pawn somehow, some way. Let's try it this way. Okay, <clears throat> so at this moment, this is the moment where I believe the warning bells for white should go off, especially if we if we believe that this bishop is stronger than the knight. Because on the next move, black can force a set of moves that make this knight trade for that bishop. Right? Let me show you what I mean. If we were to play a move like this, and black played the pawn forward and attacked the bishop, it only has one place to go. And then his knight can jump out here to a5, and we're stuck. We don't have anywhere to go with the bishop. It's going to get traded for the knight, right? And because that can happen, and because we believe now, you know, that the better of us, 
we believe now that this night is, is we don't want that to happen. <laughs> then we need to do something right now on this turn. And the thing that we need to do is we need to create a square for the bishop to retreat to if it needs to. And now that will stop black from doing all this stuff, probably. And if he does it anyways, it won't be great for him. It'll just be moving pawns forward and moving a knight to the edge of the board. And we'll have a hiding place for our bishop. This move has many different things that it just did. It created for us uh, a block so that this knight can never even travel across the board anymore. So if he were to play a move like this one and pin the knight, we're no longer worried that this is a danger <clears throat> because it's not, right? Uh, this knight can't move across the board because the pawn will take it on its way. And so this knight is fine. It's defended one time, two times. It'll never get attacked more than two times. There's only two pieces left to get to it. So we stopped this from being a threat by playing c3. And we also created a situation in the future where we might want to crash through the middle with d4 and try to win the game that way. And we probably will. Okay. And that is also now perfectly positioned for that. So this bit of strategy, because the knights, the bishop's better than the knight, caused us to want to play c3 as soon as this pawn was defended. And that defines the remainder of the opening. Because now this knight has to find a job, and it can't go here. But you know what? I'm not worried about you guys anymore. Up until this moment, I would be worried that you would have stuck a knight there and, and messed up the whole thing for yourselves. But now you know that that pawn belongs there. And because you know that pawn belongs there, you know this knight doesn't belong there. And now I think you're going to play this right every time. And I think you're going to start crushing people. I really do. Because now your pieces are going to naturally go to the correct places in the Roy Lopez. What? Right? Okay, I'm excited for you guys now. I hope you go and do. Go try this. Go do some stuff. We'll come back and visit the other odd lines soon. You guys take care. Bye now.